Welcome to Kuwait's Industrial Automation and Control Systems Cybersecurity Conference, KIAX Cybersecurity 2014, 25 through 26 May 2014. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC. So we're going to have our second panel discussion of the conference, and this is going to be entitled Proactive, Corrective, Preventative Actions to Manage Cyber Attacks. We've got a busy afternoon because we've got six panelists and one moderator. Okay, so let's introduce you to our moderator. It is, of course, Senthil Kumar. Give them a little wave, Senthil, so that they can all visualize who it is. And this is Managing Director and Regional Head of IT Consulting Services at um, Prativity. Um, joining him as one of the six panelists is Mohammed al Bakhri. Where are you, Mohammed? That's right, give them a wave. IT development leader at Equate Petrochemical Company. Joining him is Jamel Al-Balushi. <laughs> PCD IT security leader at Petroleum Development Oman. And we have Dr. Indu Singh, who is the VP and head of Washington DC operations at Los um, Alamos Technical Associates. Welcome to you. And our final three, not least, of course, is Carl Rode. Carl Rode is Information Security Consultant at Kuwait National Petroleum Company, KNPC, and Richard Powell, who, of course, you've all just met during his presentation, Manager of Cybersecurity Solutions at Plant Automation Services, PAS. And finally, it's Michelle Gia, who is the Information Technology Manager at Qatar Petrochemicals Company, QAPCO. <laughs> so gentlemen, that was quite a tongueful, I can tell you. We won't be doing seven panelists again, <laughs> without a bottle of water at least. So this is where I'm going to hand over to Senthil, the moderator, and for the next 60 minutes, we've got the panel discussion. Senthil, over to you. I'll come there to the, to the podium. Uh, very good afternoon to everybody. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, moderating this particular uh, the panel discussion today. Uh, in a way, the, the, the discussion comes up very, very good in a way that we're going to talk about three different types of or categories of controls, proactive, preventive, and corrective controls. So I'm going to be moderating it. Before we moderating it, I thought of introducing a bit of our speakers one by one, so, and also tell them about exactly what the kind of operational responsibility they have, so that any question that you may have, you can post to them as you go along. And we have reserving 15 minutes for you to put up your questions towards end of it, and you can answer the relevant questions to the relevant people, or I can moderate that for you. you. Can you presentation? So the, the first person I would like to give it to you, Mr. Mohamed al -Bavari. He is uh, heading IT department in, the, in Equate. Uh, can I have, yeah. Uh, he's, a, he's a graduate from Kuwait University, having a, a, a chemical engineering close to 20 years of experience and 18 years in, in, uh, in uh, EQUIT. And he also experienced in both process control and IT department domain. And he held all the IT security and quality assurance control. So he can't handle many of the questions if you like it. The second speaker in terms of his, uh, his experience, Mr. Jamal al Baluchi. He is from PDO, Oman, that is Petroleum Development Oman Organizations, a leading organization out in Oman. He's, he has an honors degree in computer engineering from Caledonian University, Oman. Has more than 20 years of experience in process control network and IT systems. Is currently responsible for PC and security. So if you have any security questions, operational perspective, you may like to ask him. And acquired strong knowledge on some of the leading PC and system as well. So if you have any product questions, you may also ask him. 
Dr. Indu Singh is a, is a Vice President and Head of Washington DC Operations of uh, LATA and is also a Global Director for an institute, training institute called GIST out of uh, US. He previously was a Director of Federal Government Services at Deloitte and also managed responsible for system engineering and security practices. At Bearing Point, previous to the, uh, to the Deloitte, that he has a global practice set for system engineering and security and transformation of IT systems. Dr. Singh has also published a number of books, something very eye-catching which I'm putting it, is a safe city, living free in, in the dangerous world. That's the name of the title. Probably Mr. Singh can talk about that in this discussion. And we had Richard Powell. I think I don't have to explain larger because he just presented something to you in front of me in before us. And he's one good thing about him. He has worked in a number of domains. For example, he worked in a power generating company. He worked in a signal systems for a trail, a railroad systems, as well as a board. He's also worked in now managing a product development and developing strategy for the products. So gaining all the experience of his two companies, he's probably translating that into a, a secure system for the PCN. We have Mr. Gail, and then he has a excellent uh, credentials in terms of his work experience. He is now currently IT manager, Qatar Petrochemicals, Qatar, Doga, and was a CIO of Total, uh, the company Total, Gas and Power Divisions, was in charge of IT strategy at the group level, and CIO also Petrochemicals Divisions of Global Operations of Total. Uh, he has a master's in engineering and IT from INC Lynch, France. And Karen Road is an information security consultant, currently working with Kuwait National Petroleum Company, KNPC, uh, very close to us, and focusing on operational improvement and security best practices. I think that's a very important because everybody talks about best practices, but how much the best practices applicable to you is a, is a person who can share knowledge with you in terms of how do you relevantly take and leverage those particular best practices for your organizations and that. As a diverse experience in implementing identity and access control management, particularly you can talk about access control if you like it, and also you can talk about policy procedures which are relevant for your organizations. In there. Assistant clients in retail, finance, and education, and petrochemical sector. He worked with many companies and uh, worked with leading software vendors as well. And he has pro provided a start process for SAEM, DLP, and fraud management solutions in there. And me. I'm nothing. I'm, <laughs> I'd ask questions to the panel members and to receive questions from you. All right. Okay. My name is Santil Kumar. I'm a manager, regional managing director for ID Consulting Services for Pretty Pretty is in a global consulting organization. Has presence in all over the globe. In GCC, we have offices in several different offices, seven different locations in in the Middle East. I'm heading GCC practice. I have a more than 25 years of experience into a pure consulting, ID consulting engagements currently managing some of the cybersecurity assessment for regional oil and the petrochemical companies, conducted recently a cybersecurity workshop in Kuwait and Bahrain. It's well attended, well received for the people. Now we have talked about, now we're getting into the topics that we're going to talk about it. I'm just going to put some kind of controls out here. Probably you can add some more if you like it. But not necessarily we're going to take everything at, 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 as we go along. We may have to select some of them and talk about it. So the first question, first control, which is a pro productive control, so you can talk about as in a governance and strategy, yeah? So far we have been talking about, in so many different people talked about technologies largely, and how the technology can be used it and then can be secured kind of thing. But very less discussion on a governance happened. Do you agree with me? There are very less discussion on a governance. So let's ask Mr. Indu Singh in terms of what do you like to highlight the importance of governance and strategy to handle or manage or mitigate cybersecurity attacks and risk? Mr. Indra Singh. Thank you. So I too would like to express my sincere thank for, for the conference. Uh, it's an excellent conference. And uh, I hope this, this endeavor continues in the future. Um, we have a short period of time, so I'd like to take a slightly different approach. I mean, we have excellent two days, almost two days, on technology, risk management, governance, and everything else. And there is not much that I can really add. But what I really like to do is to bring a different perspective. So 
if you are putting a governance and cybersecurity strategy, what are the challenges that you are facing now? Now, this is based on the work that I do. I, I build systems, uh, both OT and, and, and IT in 44 countries. Um, and I have traveled in this part of the world for the last 12 years. We are in almost every GCC country. So I do have the, the local knowledge to really relate to you. So it is important to understand five or six of these challenges that you will be facing as ma senior management team and as corporations, individual corporations, while you are thinking about putting this governance and um, you know, cyber security strategy for your organization. The first and foremost that we missed the board in this, in this conference so far, which to me probably is one of the biggest challenge that we are going to face in the next five years, and that is the dearth of trained cybersecurity resources. That is going to be the biggest challenge. We can buy all the technology, we can have all the plans and everything else, but at the end of the day, you're going to need the cyber engineers who are really going to implement what you want. Now, let me give you an example. In the United States alone, today, what we have estimated in the next five years, we're going to need 500,000 cyber engineers. You know what? Based on our training facilities and the resources that we have, right now we have 20%. We can meet only 20% of the demand. When I put the same question in the framework of GCC countries, where there already is a shortage of resources, so think about how you're going to meet that. That is going to be one of the key challenges in putting the strategy and the governance and, and creating the cyber defense. And there are options for you that you know, we can talk later on. The second one is, which is going to be equally important, is to really moving the cyber to the boardroom. Now, I was very pleased to see four CEOs here. And in Kuwait, taking this a step to organize this conference for Kuwait, I think you're already ahead. But biggest challenge that we are facing I'm facing in my business when I go to corporations, that the cyber is still considered at the IT department level, while the risk is really from the top, not from the bottom. And until we really move that to that level, you will not be effectively creating the cyber defense. So the IT department alone cannot really carry this burden. The third one is the lack of policies and governance that we find even most of our mature client environment in the United States, they believe that because they have a proven IT security policies, by default, they have the cybersecurity policy and they are safe. And we are told quite often, that is not the case. You have to revisit your IT security policies. You have to revisit your current IT governance policies and move it to the higher level. That's the third challenge you're going to face. And fourth one, who I believe is a little longer term, but we must start thinking about them now. Ultimately, the convergence of physical security and the cyber security must take place for several reasons. Because while we are all excited about cyber security, out of fear mostly, we must not forget that physical security remains the first line of defense. A lot of things can be done in terms of the infrastructure facilities for cybersecurity within the existing facility. Let me give you an example. Microsoft just has become our global partner on security. We have taken Microsoft's security platform called GSOC, Global Security Operations Center that Microsoft currently uses to manage security in 700 offices in 44 countries from three locations, Seattle, Hyderabad, India, and UK. We are building with Microsoft the fourth facility in our office in Washington, DC. What we have done, we have taken their fundamental uh, platform, security platform, and converted that to what we call ICC, Intelligent Command Center. And then we took a sector approach. So we created ICC for oil and gas, ICC for ports, airports, uh, for cyber command, for safe city. That is where we have to go. Because ultimately, if we believe 
that the security has to have an integrated approach, then you have to have an intelligent, integrated platform to, to manage this. Um, Let me, I'm running out of time, so I'll say two more things. There has to be a full integration of your process control, engineering team, and your IT team. Across the board, including the United States, what we find that basically there are two divisions within the organization. One is your OT, another is IT, and we have been talking about that. And that gap remains. And that gap is not because these people are not capable of cross-breeding. The gap is because they are both very competent in what they do in their own field, but they do not fully understand each other's roles and responsibility. And so that a strategy to really have more cross-breeding between these two will be very critical to cybersecurity defense. And the last but not least, we can do everything that we want. Remember, the training is going to be one of the most vital cyber security strategy for you. And this training has to be at every level. We have just been asked by the government of India to bring in the CEO of 350 companies owned by government of India and create a cybersecurity executive awareness program. And that kind of thing has to be done at all levels, the senior executive, the manager, not just at IT level and the plant level. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Indus. I think he's comprehensively uh, addressed many of the controls that we're trying to talk about it. The next, uh, the, the next important question, or maybe the domain I would like to dwell upon. We have been talking about controls today, and we have been talking about a lot of uh, technical controls in that. But these controls has to be against some risk that we know also risk. But we cannot be going directly to control, put every control possible unless we do a proper risk assessment and risk treatment plan. So in that particular perspective, I would like to ask these questions to Mr. Michael. Uh, in terms of in, when, how do you perform, or how did you perform or in your previous organizations in terms of any risk assessment? And what standards that did you follow for doing a risk assessment and accordingly put up a controls to them? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, before to answer to your question, I would like to, uh, to congratulate uh, the company Equate for having organized such, uh, such event. Uh, they succeeded to, uh, uh, to, to bring some top level uh, cyber security uh, talent. Uh, very well done and congratulations. Uh, to come back to, to, to your question, uh, in terms of risk management, so, uh, in the company I'm working for, the first thing that uh, we did is to add a risk to the risk register, mm -hmm. the cyber security, so to identify cyber security as a risk. Okay. Okay. After that, uh, it's linked to the governance, we have to uh, select a framework mm -hmm. to help us to organize ourselves, so we decided to take an IT framework. Okay. Uh, ISO 2701. Uh, ISO 2001, yeah. Yeah. Uh, why uh, an IT fr <coughs> framework? Very simply because uh, I would say IT is confronted to cyber security for a long time with the virus, the malware, the yeah. worms. Okay. Uh, on the other side, the OT, it's more recent. Yeah. Okay. So we thought that it would, would be easier mm -hmm. to start with an IT uh, ISO 2701. Yeah. Uh, to establish the bridge between IT and mm -hmm. OT. So we created a, a cyber security steering committee mm -hmm. with members for both operations and IT mm -hmm. and uh, talking, discussing and taking decisions on, uh, on cyber, security, uh, okay. cyber security risk. So it's very successful and then implemented in a, in a manner which is really addressing the risk. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, it's uh, Successful. Okay. Uh, last thing I can add regarding a risk uh, assessment, mm -hmm. you need also to assess your situation. Yes. Okay. And uh, so one thing that uh, we try to do is to do some penetration testing. So we okay. do some assessments on documentation, looking at uh, at uh, architecture of the networks, both industrial and, and IT. But it's not enough. Yeah, it's better. Okay, so we had to select some uh, external partners to help us to assess the situation both in IT and in the industrial system. So, 
obviously it's not so easy to mm -hmm. assess the industrial system because yeah. there are a few windows where you can do some penetration testing. Mm -hmm. But there are some some windows. Yep. I'll take an example. Mm -hmm. Recently we have a uh, general shutdown of the plant. Mm -hmm. so it was a unique opportunity to do uh, penetration testing on yeah. the uh, yeah. industrial system. And to do that, uh, it's something that we have not talked about. I really think that uh, we are talking about cyber security, cyber threat, but in front of us, we have enemies. Who are our enemies? I think that our enemies are very well organized. Okay. Well organized, yeah. Sometimes organized an, arm, an, an army, okay? Army of battle, and, yeah. And uh, so to do the, the testing and to help us, I recommended my company to look at the defense industry Different. and to look at the companies working in the defense industry because they are aware about who are oh, the enemies. consultants from the defense industry background. Yeah. Wow, that's so right. we did some uh, penetration testing and I think it was uh, really successful mm -hmm. and also it, is it has established, I can say, a good uh, confidence between mm -hmm. operation and IT. Okay. Last point I, I would like to add regarding uh, governance and risk assessment is that yeah. IT will never manage the DCS, okay? Neither uh, the DCS will manage the uh, IP address plan, okay. which is an IT thing, okay? So each part must do, must be accountable and responsible for some tasks, yeah. okay? So we try to uh, put in place the RACI methodology, RACI okay, method. to help okay. everybody to be accountable and yeah. responsible to what we should do. The RACI matrix, yeah? That's accountability to establish. Fantastic, yeah. Okay. Last point on governance, uh, we cannot work only uh, internally. Mm -hmm. We have to work with external stakeholders. External, yes. yeah. external stakeholders. When we are talking about DCS, we cannot work without uh, talking to the, the provider of the DCS. Correct. In our case, it's only well, it can be uh, your programmer, you, you have to work with them. Excellent. Yeah, there's stakeholders you, to be taken into consideration. You have also to work with the government or mm. the external stakeholders yes. from the country you are working. Uh, Excellent. That's a good point. If I take an example, for, for instance, in Qatar, mm -hmm. now we are going to publish a, a new law, CIPP law, uh -huh. uh, which I think it's a very good initiative to force the key companies to, be, uh, to take action, to take care about cyber security. So obviously we have to uh, be aware, we have to uh, communicate with ICT Qatar, which, uh, which, okay. which are in charge to, to publish this law. Moving on, I think uh, as you correctly said in the last, that then we need to communicate and make them aware. I would like to ask this question to Mohamed Albari in terms of the importance of awareness program. How much we had to do it and uh, what level we need to go to educate people in that. Thank, uh, thank you, Srinthal, for this question. I think before I can uh, answer this question, I need to quote from uh, Mr. Earl Perkins from Gartner. Cybersecurity technology won't save your company. Cybersecurity begins with people. People, yes. Begins so you, with people. Yes. So you, people is very important element of the cybersecurity if they are not the first defense. First level of defense. Exactly. And you need to have level of people, people who are, who are aware, educated, skilled, and expert in that area. What we have done in Equate, e we have created a unique cross-functional team to bring the two different worlds, OT and IT, together. And what we have done, we have allocated a dedicated resources from IT that will, they will work on the control systems, network, and they don't touch anything on the business network. So to create the mindset of people who understand the criticality of those assets and also to work on putting the right measures and right security policies for the control system. Uh, apart of, from that also what we have done, we have also in Equate created a unique um, or you could say a program for a uh, mentor and mentee program to ensure the, the uh, knowledge transfer from the senior people to the junior people. So this is another way of educating the team. 
Beside what we are doing as a part of the campaign for preparation for the ISO 27001, uh, we have done last year uh, a campaign for preparation, and this year also we are continuing for the uh, awareness. I guess this is in summary what we have uh, uh, done yeah. so far for the Very education good. part. I think you said it correct, Mr. Mohammed, because people or the staff or the stakeholders become the weakest point, weakest link in the entire uh, supply uh, security chain. And if you do not educate them, do not aware them, we are as weak as uh, they are. Very good. Thanks for that. Can I add uh, something? Yes, Mr. Jamal. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the organizers of this uh, conference. I really enjoyed it. Uh, just to add on uh, what has been said Mr. is, uh, in fact, in PDO, we, we started the awareness of the people who are working around the ICS system okay. or the PCD system. So we started with the operators, mm -hmm. with the maintenance team, yeah, educating them on how important is the security around these systems and not to use USBs and not to share the passwords uh, and so forth and so on. So we did a road show basically for three months yeah. going around all the sites, mm -hmm. uh, uh, educating them. And it is a continuous process yes, which we are following along with it. We are working with the IT department to automate the whole process okay. in the sense that no one should be given access to the PCD or ICS system unless he has done this online training with you. All right. That, that's, that's what we are doing currently. Good. Excellent. I think that's a three months time before you're getting into systems, have yes. to be trained up yes. well so that he doesn't do any error or maybe even some kind of yeah. thing. It's a very good point. I think as they, at one point is that like, even though they are the weakest link in the system, if they have been trained, if they have been aware, and they are the f one of the first defense for us, they are the most, most defensive people for, for us to protect our infrastructure there. Moving on, I think uh, going to the next one is about, we talked about a lot of time testing, and uh, many times about testing and intrusion detection system. But you know, testing is something which is always be a bit of a, uh, little bit psychological fear instead of what I'm going to knock off something or whatever. So in that way, there's something like another solution which is like continuous monitoring and malware productions comes up to a larger extent nowadays. And it, it detects what's happening in Korean. Mr. Richard, like to, Mr. Richard, do you like to talk about something about continuous monitoring malware productions on a process control networks? What technology is available? How we can make them uh, used in the particular things to detect or uh, any any vulnerabilities or any suspicious activities happening on the network? Sure. Uh, speaking specifically from my background in the uh, electric industry in the United States and NERC SIP, uh, security testing is a requirement uh, of those regulations. Uh, so functional testing though, starting there, yeah. everyone does functional testing Yes. Uh, to make sure the application the uh, specifically for process controls, the DCS responds the way it should. Uh, but security testing uh, is something that's commonly overlooked. Overlooked, yeah. Uh, and so... Overlooked, not done, yeah. Yes, overlooked, not done, not thought of. And commonly, uh, people first have to understand what security controls they have in place. Mm -hmm. So the first part of that is to document what your security protections are, uh, whether they be passwords, user accounts, service accounts, ports and services. Um, all of those have to be first documented because they are also going to vary from company to company. Uh, and then based on that, then you can start looking at the technology uh, because there are going to be different applications which may test different things. You, you may use WMI scripts. Uh, you may use a uh, automated vulnerability assessment type tool. Uh, you may use a, uh, a scanning tool. Uh, so it really starts with identifying the security controls, and then you can move into identifying uh, whether it be scripts or 
uh, commercial tools to start performing those tests. Uh, but it's also very important to keep in mind, particularly when you're dealing with, uh, say, Windows systems, yeah. is uh, the security testing is essential because most vendors, uh, in my experience, they will identify the changes that occur with their software, uh, but they will not, they depend on the underlying operating system, say .NET, uh, for certain functionality within the applications, and they don't always know how that underlying framework is going to respond and what ports and services may mm -hmm. uh, be initiated or come up with a patch for that. Good. Mr. Jamal, this question's to you. I think probably that you are a security engineer for Process Control Network. Uh, what do you think about the vulnerability and patch management con contracts? Do you think about uh, if a vendor says the patch is not possible, can we remain calm or what we should be doing it? Do we think about any controls? <clears throat> uh, we know that uh, Microsoft uh, releases patches every month, basically every Tuesday of every month. Uh, in uh, PDO, what we did is we have built uh, something called PCAD. Mm -hmm. It is process control access domain, okay. where it interface with the uh, office domain. So in this PCAD, we have several servers, which one of them is a patch management servers, mm -hmm. antivirus servers, and uh, file transfer servers, and access control servers. So basically, the PCAD is the safe zone, or it is uh, a, a boundary between the office and the process control. Currently, we are receiving the patches manual. We are putting them on the patch management server manually. Then on that patch management servers, we have categorized the vendors mm -hmm. into four folders, basically, Honeywell, Emerson, Foxboro, and Yokogawa. Mm -hmm. And we put the patches according to these folders. Then we do push them manually. Uh, we, we push them from the patch management server manually to a respective vendor. Okay. Yeah. And then if required a reboot, then the people at site will take care of the rebooting of the server. And of course, change management mm -hmm. plays a big part in, in that sense before anybody reboot any machine. Correct. Yeah. It's good. I think, uh, could you also talk about something like, you know, an, an access control mechanism? Because uh, many times we see uh, yeah, not a unique user ID, not uh, ever a group user ID, or then, or there's no granularities in an access control. How do you handle that in your, in your environment? Uh, what sort of controls that common sense controls available? There are two type of uh, access or user who are accessing the PCD. Uh, we have a lot of users on the office domain, like the programmers, mm -hmm. the petroleum technologists, the process optimization team, who need to access the process control domain in order to see some data or to do some optimization on that. Now, in the PCAD, we have uh, the access is basically through the Cetrix. Mm -hmm. And we are using two factor authentication. Two factor authentication. Two factor authentication, yeah. And to and um, those users, they will be given a specific site, specific PC with a specific application mm -hmm. to that extent. And the PCAD administrator, basically, he has the control of those users. He can shadow them and see what they are doing exactly. Okay. And, and they don't have the, the system. And every user from the office, he is defined on the process control domain. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we know who has access at what level his access is that. Then we have external users where if we require support from TAC, mm -hmm. Technical Support Center, these users basically they are temporary. We give them access on required. Okay. And when we give them access again, they will follow the same category okay. by using two-factor authentication. And again, we will be monitoring them when they access and and now we are in the process putting a recording, basically, recording. on what they are doing, mm -hmm. so that we know exactly what is going on when right. they access our system. So it is not only logging, it's a recording. Yes. Oh, that's really good. That's really good. Right. Moving on to the next one, I think this, uh, this, uh, this particular question goes to Mr. Carroll. 
in terms of uh, what do you think about and how important is the particular architecture and design plays in security layers and what sort of uh, you know, standards that you would uh, recommend to be followed? Thank you. Um, everybody is thanking somebody in the, in this, in the session and, and one of the people I'd like to thank for making today and yesterday very interesting and making sure that the flow was good as, as our MC. Uh, she's done such a wonderful job. Uh, thank you very much. Um, around the architecture, um, th there's, there's a couple of different ways of looking at architecture. Um, historically, architects have designed buildings and built bridges and so forth. And if we look at some of the bridges that's been built many, many years ago in, in Greeks and, uh, and, and in Rome and so forth, they are still standing because some very fundamental principles were applied in architecture and design and even today they are still being mimicked and used throughout. So often we see folks in actual fact designing networks and designing systems without due consideration for the fundamental architecture components. Uh, enterprise architecture is, is therefore a discipline that sits on, its, on, on the one side. A system architecture sits on the other side concerned with the design of the application and how it interac interacts and connects how it uses the transport of the network and so forth. Security architecture, though, is something that sits in between the two and is a kind of a liaison between the two because it needs to, in actual fact, hold hands on both sides. But it's not a discipline that's given the due attention that is in actual fact required to make sure that things proceed and, and progress uh, in a sufficient way. So to pick, for example, on uh, the example that was just used from an authentication point of view, you may design your system for role-based access control, or you may design your system for rule-based access control. But as a principle, you need to make a decision on which one of those two disciplines you will follow. You cannot necessarily do both. Uh, building into that, uh, then a strong authentication model, uh, the auditing model that requires, for example, logs to be extracted from the interactions of various systems so that further investigations and uh, non-repudiation can be followed is something that you need to build fundamentally into the architecture. Uh, one point which I really picked up from your conversation and it's also part of the thing, probably I'll ask, uh, I'll direct this uh, questions to Mr. Mohamed Albari. Um, recently, you, uh, I know myself very well that you were recently done some audit on your process control and IT systems thing. Uh, what do you feel about what kind of value additions that particular independent review added up to you and what sort of value additions that you really implementing now? I think uh, for any uh, IT systems or OT systems, the first thing you need to do to understand where are you at is to do an audit, an independent audit. Yes. This will give you a clear picture if you have any gaps in your system and how do you how you can build your plan to close these gaps and recently we have done one uh, audit uh, we identified many or let's say uh, some gaps in the systems uh, related to security some of them related to patch management uh, and we have put a plan to close these uh, gaps yeah. So it's a, audit is provides you a kind of third party view or independent view and it provides, it's always considered as a third line of defense and it, it provides you a bit of an assurance to you whether where are you and what action that you can do it. Uh, it when, when we're talking about uh, particularly uh, incidents, I had to come to the mind that earlier we never even thought about having incidents in our procedures earlier. For example, going back to the standards, when uh, British standard double seven double nine which came into uh, existence and uh, the first time they talked about incident management yeah and that that's the time that is everybody thought about there's going to be something happening let's have incident management so in this question in this particular way i would like to ask uh, mr mitchell in terms of incident management process that you have in your organization and how does it picks up some of the suspicious activities if at all comes up and also how you respond back to that particular incidents being reported to you in terms of once for all mitigating it or have it some temporary fix for the time being 
and mitigate it for the long time. Yes, unfortunately, unfortunately, we have incidents. Yeah. Uh, sometimes <laughs> Do happen. you cannot avoid, and you have to learn. So you need to be prepared to manage incidents uh, using uh, using the methodology and also using some tools. You have to uh, you must have a tool to register incidents, okay. to record your incidents. Uh, you need to have a communication process mm -hmm. because if it is an incident impacting a large number of users or impacting the the business. You need to be able to communicate, so you need to prepare a process to communicate on incident. And after that, you need to have uh, tools mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to find what is happening. So, uh, more and more technology uh, provides uh, tools with a lot inf of information, too, too much information. So yeah. uh, quite often, you need a tool to, to filter information. So in uh, our company, we are using Splunk mm -hmm. uh, tool, which is very useful to help us to identify when is uh, where's the problem and how to fix the problem. It's a real-time environment? It picks up the things as it happens? No, it's a, it's a collector of all the information uh, collected in real-time real at the other tools, mm -hmm. but you can filter, filter. Mm -hmm. that help you to, uh, to detect what is happening. Right. Uh, and once you have fixed, uh, obviously, you have to, uh, to uh, engage some lesson learned uh, to prepare for the future, to, uh, to be ready uh, to protect your environment, to avoid uh, this kind of incident. Mm -hmm. uh, this is what I can say regarding uh, incident management. Uh, you need to be prepared because it will happen. Yeah, it happens. It, it happens, happens yeah. it will happen, it okay. will happen again. Okay. You cannot avoid that. Uh, you have uh, some uh, minor incident, you have to report an incident, uh, this is, I can say, you have to follow the, the, okay. the process that you okay. One thing that is quite key also is to communicate on incident. Communicate uh, the yeah. incident. Uh -huh. I know it's not easy to communicate because once, once a company has, has been impacted by a cyber attack, nobody wants to communicate. Yeah. Okay. Because uh, you consider that you did something wrong, uh, you don't want to, to show that you are weak and fit this. And this is, a, this is a pity because if you don't communicate uh, with your colleagues, your partners, how can uh, in the future you can uh, avoid uh, okay. such incident with uh, your colleagues and partners? So we have to find a way to communicate each other on a confidential way, okay? not communicating to everybody, but to have some key focal uh, contact to communicate with so that people can very good. Protect themselves and be prepared to the same good. incident. That is, you touched upon a very important point about communicating incident which happens, probably internally and externally. I would like, I'd like to drop on one incident which I came or maybe read about it. Um, you may be knowing about two, two, one, one and a half years back, there was an incident happening on uh, Sony uh, systems, Sony a company out in the US. Um, the response they gave immediately after the incident attack, they say, oh, nothing happening to me, don't worry, I'm happy, I'm, I'm serving you as it is. But same time, within a, week, within a week's time, they have been down again and had to do a really a sorry uh, excuse, saying that, oh, I'm sorry, I was attacked earlier, I'm also now attacked now. So it really provides a very you know, embarrassing moment for the people who are not communicating or maybe putting it close. The last question that is from our panel discussion, and I'm going to throw open this to others, is about uh, the, uh, do you have come across, and this is for Mr. S Mr. Singh, um, uh, recovery procedures. We are not talking about incident, now we are bringing recovery. Uh, a compromised site or maybe a system has been really attacked. And how do we come up with the recovery plans and procedures? And you know, nowadays every, every framework talks about recovery also. We cannot omit them or we cannot ignore them. So uh, can you throw upon some lights on recovery procedures required for cybersecurity incidents or uh, larger incidents for PC network? Mr. Singh, to you. Oh, is that for me? Sorry. I thought it was for Mark. He's the <laughs> no, no. confederation guy, so he will answer it. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> can you need to repeat that question? Yes, please. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> He, wa he wants you to repeat the repeat. question. Repeat the question. Okay. All right. Uh, the question that I asked, incidents is something like, you know, uh, a minor defect or minor incidents happen which can be recovered easily. 
But when a compromise has happened, when a system is completely down because of security reasons, if you remember like in a, the, from US, there is a federal, federal government has reached it with NAST, mm -hmm. and which talks about recovery procedures specifically for cyber city attacks and in case if you're down with that. So what's your, 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 uh, what's your thought process on recovery procedures and how do you plan your recovery in case if you have been attacked? Uh, first, I'll start with uh, the incident response procedure uh, because there is a direct link between incident response as it escalates or as the case becomes more severe may result in disaster. Uh, so it may result in disaster recovery. Uh, so classifying and communicating are key aspects to that. But once you get to disaster recovery, having a plan in place, mm -hmm. plan in place. Yeah. And is critical. Uh, and as part of that plan, uh, using the fundamental mindset that you may not have your normal personnel available to execute mm -hmm, the plan. Mm -hmm. So the assumption has to be, let's say, uh, what the basic skill set is. So for a DCS, you may say, I have someone who is familiar with uh, Honeywell DCS. He may not be my administrator, mm -hmm. but he's a Honeywell DCS administrator. So the procedure has to be written at that level. Yeah. Uh, so there are also certain aspects that have to be written into the procedure and kept current. Sure. Uh, and let's start back with the communication. Mm -hmm. So who are the members of the team? Uh, who and under what situations do things get escalated? Uh, the communications. Uh, and then moving into um, spare inventory, mm -hmm. so for the hardware, uh, also for the licenses, the software. Where are the backups yeah. located? Uh, where are the license keys? Uh, the, any configuration that backups that may occur, uh, that you may have. Uh, and then finally, the keeping a record or keeping a, a contact, the contact information for any s vendors uh, yeah. that support to contracts contacted, that you may yeah. have. Sure. That's good. I think, may, uh, may, I, may I add one sure. more thing to this? So in the United States, as you know, um, we have specific guidelines that our agencies, as government agencies, has put together. For example, for the Department of Energy has specific guidelines for utilities, they have for nuclear plants, for pipelines. So that is, that is a fundamental thing that industries across the board uh, have to really use. Not a requirement because our government cannot impose, it's a guideline. But these are guidelines that have been agreed upon both by the public sector and the private sectors. So industry's input has gone into that and those are pretty good standards to okay. use. No, I think yes. uh, one more one more thing sure. that needs sorry to be, needs to be added to this. Uh, once we've gone through the the incident response and the recovery phase, it's very important to wrap things up mm -hmm. and to actually take all of your responders teams and bring them together in a room and actually sit them down and and get back to the, the lessons learned. Mm -hmm. uh, what processes can we go back to from the, the start of the, the of the whole cycle yeah. that we can revisit, improve on? Uh, procedures that can be revisited, improved on, and also people factors, training, awareness, Very that good. again needs to be revisited. Maybe uh, an awareness program needs to be relaunched, uh, reinitiated, energized uh, because, uh, because of a specific incident. That's a good point, yeah. Lesson learned has to be recirculated, corrected. It. Now the floor is open to all the questions to the participants and uh, yeah, I can see like a couple of hands comes up. And we've got a couple of questions. We've got about 10 minutes, and so, okay. so your name, your company, and your question, please, sir. Uh, my name is Marcel. I'm from Kuwait National Petroleum Company. And the question is to Monsieur Michel, Michel Guy. Uh, you mentioned that you did some testing for your systems. If it is, not pos if it is possible to share with us the results, were there serious findings on the OT s systems? 
and what was done after that? Uh, yes, we did some uh, penetration testing, and you have or you learn always some uh, something about your weakness. Uh, on the OT side, I think the penetration testing was quite successful. The, the, uh, how we how we, we we did organize this testing? We uh, use uh, we made a tender. We selected a company to do uh, three kind of tests to penetrate our IT system from external, to penetrate our industrial system from external, and after that we allow the company to enter the IT network. We gave, we gave them all the password and like this to uh, network diagram, and we asked them to penetrate the industrial system network. This is the kind of test that we did, uh, and I think it was quite successful. They discovered some weaknesses, they, it was successful also, they, they couldn't penetrate the industrial systems. That's good. Which was That's quite good, good news. So, so inside out and outside in and then interfaces. Fantastic work. Yeah. Excellent. Yes, please. But uh, I'm ready to share you a bit more information uh, on one to one. I would say that, yeah. Please. Hi, this is Abdurrafil Feili from Impulse International. <coughs> My question is, a simple way where the end users, which is uh, today is the more important for any organization to create either from education perspective or create a lot of different types of security to protect any networks uh, for, for, that, for any organization. But if there is any plan or any development to create the end users to be a proactive element in securing the network, proactive element to the securing element. So, yes, yes, Mr. Carroll. Yeah. I come from a, a country where gun control laws are quite strong and uh, for you to be able to con um, own a firearm, you need a license. For you to drive a car properly, um, you need to in actual fact go through some training and earn a license. Uh, unfortunately, most users that use the internet and use a computer uh, never earn a license and never get trained on how to use that device properly. Yes, we have heard before now that nobody has been killed um, because of an internet incident, but uh, I think in the, in the SCADA and, and PLC environments, uh, these disasters can be having very grave consequences. Uh, we need to sit together and, and get to define a program internally that will install the proper habits and methods for people to use the infrastructure and, and the computing resources responsibly. And, and that responsibly needs to, to, to uh, be developed. We, we can't say what it is for your own organization. Each will be different. But that program needs to be started. And you need to, in actual fact, be retested for your license potentially every six months, every year, so that user awareness and other training is, is uh, continuously brought top of mind. So, Mohamed Bari, do you like to answer about it? Because you did a fantastic awareness program in Equate recently, and how proactively users are coming up to uh, work with the cybersecurity. Actually, when you talk about the OT part, uh, there are not much uh, flexibility for the end user because he's in the he's main concern is to run the, the plant, so we almost disable everything for him. Mm -hmm. He can only see the plant screens mm -hmm. to run the plant. He's not able to use anything, USB, minimizing the screen, nothing. So it is almost, you will not feel anything different between okay. the open system or closed okay. system. Okay. Good. Yeah, the third question. Oops, sorry. Third question, please. Hello. Yeah, uh, my name is Abraham. I am from Larson and Tubro Infotech. Uh, my question is uh, to the panel, anybody who can uh, sh show some light on this, and it's prompted by two uh, discussion points which came up. One is, you know, shortage of people uh, and capacity of cybersecurity professionals, and the other is, uh, you know, the large amount of information. So today, when we are doing cybersecurity, we have information which is coming from, you know, all the log files, the firewalls, there are so many, uh, you know, uh, access controls, IP cameras, uh, and there are some, you know, uh, tools like SIEM tools. So my question here is, uh, 
is there an integrated environment which can handle this real time information coming from so many different sources and minimize the you know human effort and automate the whole aspect of uh, cyber security compliance that's question number 1 and can we use this for a sort of situational awareness to be able to predict what is the risk profile of an organization or what are the you know threats which are you know not yet become an uh, event but sort of uh, help to prevent this from happening do you like to would you yeah, like to take it yeah, yeah, first. <clears throat> so one of the things that is happening in the united states that there is almost a new kind of business that is cropping up and it's called continuous monitoring these are your a private command and control that take charge of your to your network. They give you 24 by 7 monitoring. They they deal with your compliance. They uh, uh, they will alert you, um, and and they become your first line of defense. And and that as it becomes a little more sophisticated, I think that's going to be more and more automated uh, in in that sense. But my personal personal feeling is that the ultimate solution for for cyber security will be technology driven. And that will be when we are able to create artificial intelligence driven, what I call uh, cyber security navigation. Uh, these are navigation agents that will be able to be the first line of defense, detect and protect. Because humanly, it doesn't matter how many people, we, how many engineers we put on the network, is really not possible. We're talking about security. Security, there's a big difference between managing risk and managing security. Security is a matter of a split seconds in our environment, okay? Catching an incident on the right time, in the right way, and having the right solution is very critical. It's a split second decisions that means millions of dollars, right? And so I think ultimately that's where we're heading, but what you, we see a new trend through these, these enterprises that are evolving, and, and we're likely to be one of them through ICC, that that is the service that is evolving that will compensate the corporate capabilities. The last question? Then, right, okay. Yeah, Just I have a question, one more, yeah. Uh, uh, Joe Fernandez from Intra Establishment for uh, System Integration in Kuwait. Uh, this question goes out to uh, Michelle. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, your company takes recommendations or have requested recommendations from the defense sector for uh, protective or preventive control measures. So just wondering if you could share with us, uh, you know, some salient differences between the industrial sector and the defense sector. For example, are they uh, following different standards that we already have or, uh, or and if they are uh, exercising more rigorous audit measures, for example? Okay, thank you for your question. In fact, what, uh, uh, what I highlighted is that uh, we are talking about uh, cybersecurity but we are never talking about who are behind the cybersecurity, who are our enemies. And what we noticed uh, in the last uh, attacks in the Middle East, main attacks, in that behind these uh, threats and attacks, uh, you can find some very well organized organization, maybe some countries, I don't know. Yeah. But you have an organization very well organized organized like an army, okay? And we are not used to, uh, to face that. We are industry, okay? Uh, we cannot fight with that. So what I recommended is to, uh, to knock the door to the defense industry, to have, you have some companies, consulting companies, working both from defense and uh, the industry, who, who are, in my opinion, uh, much better uh, tooled uh, to, uh, to face and to help us uh, to, uh, to protect against uh, the new threats. I take an example, uh, you have more and more uh, defense industry also. If you take the uh, airplane industry, with what did happen with the uh, Malaysian airplane recently, yeah. 
We don't know what, what did happen, but what I know is that uh, today, all the new planes you can control from the ground. Okay. So if uh, one hacker can succeed to take control of a plane, it can happen uh, bad things. Okay. So all the, the, the airplanes industry is working on that, is trying to protect their, their planes. Okay. And a plane is, is a DCS, it's a complex DCS. Uh, to uh, protect uh, this DCS. So we can use these uh, companies working on the, for the airplane, airplane industry to help us to protect ourselves. This was uh, can say the message that I sent to my uh, dump management and uh, the last, I would say, the last penetration testing. We use a company uh, working uh, in the defense industry. We use uh, Airbus Defense, so former Cassidian. Uh, we want the, the, the tender, but you have also uh, it's a European company. You have some American company working in this in this domain. I'm thinking to Man Mandiant. You, you have also Thales, French company, uh, okay. British aer aer Aerospace. Uh, we can help you. Really good. Okay, uh, to just sum it up on the last one minute, uh, I would like to you to take back this particular uh, message, at least from me. Uh, every organization, like your organizations, is vulnerable and you need to take only one particular point. What is the hack value your organizations provides to the, ex to the hack hackivist? Let me repeat again. What is your organization provides hack value to the hackers? You understand that first, and accordingly all the controls can fall in place. If you do not know the hack value, what is that is behind, why is behind view, none of the controls are going to be useful for you. If you understand the hack value, your controls will be fall in place. Thank you very much for this uh, panel members. An excellent discussion. We put it up to them. And thank you very much, participants. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause for our moderator, Senthil. Thank you very much indeed. And gentlemen, thank you all very much indeed. You may now leave the hot chair. So thanks to Michelle, Richard, Indu, Jamal, Mohammed, and Carl. Thank you, gentlemen. Well done. Thank you. Hosted and organized by Equate Petrochemical Company in partnership with KPC.